Hello everybody and welcome back. This is Learn Hittite. I hope you're all having a fantastic day. In this video, we're going to talk about the Anatolian language family and its internal and external relationships. So firstly, let's talk about what exactly is the relationship between Anatolian and Proto-Indo-European, because actually that in itself is heavily discussed. Most commonly, you can see the relationship between the various Indo-European languages as a tree model, most of which show something like this, that the Anatolian languages branched off first and Tocharian second. Sometimes different terminology is used at different nodes. For example, Archaic Indo-European or Late Proto-Indo-European, but basically the tree resembles what we have here. However, some researchers see the Anatolian and Proto-Indo-European relationship differently. In 1938, linguist Sturtevant gave a presentation outlining what he called the Indo-Hittite hypothesis. Sturtevant suggested that due to the presence of archaic forms in Hittite, alongside common innovations present in all other Indo-European branches, but conspicuously missing in Hittite, then rather we should see Hittite as a sibling to the Indo-European languages, rather than one of them. The Indo-Hittite hypothesis is more commonly called the Indo-Anatolian hypothesis these days, the name update reflects the fact that Hittite isn't the sole occupant of the Anatolian branch. Brosman, 2002, goes over some of the main ideas in favour of the Indo-Hittite, Indo-Anatolian hypothesis. In our discussion today, however, it's important to know that nobody disputes the connection between Anatolian languages and the Indo-European languages. Rather, the crux lies in the distinction that some researchers propose. They argue that there's enough differentiation between Indo-European and Anatolian to warrant categorising them as separate branches of the same proto-language, which they term Indo-Hittite or Indo-Anatolian. In the literature, Jan Purvel has long opposed the Indo-Hittite hypothesis and the early divergence of Anatolian from broader Indo-European. Other scholars have approached the evidence for the Indo-Hittite hypothesis with caution. However, there is a third faction coalescing around a consensus in favour of Indo-Hittite. Additionally, there is considerable debate surrounding the timing of the split of Anatolian from Indo-European, with those who support the Indo-Anatolian-Indo-Hittite hypothesis generally putting their weight behind earlier divergence. Indo-Anatolian gains notable reinforcement from the recent potential identification of Anatolian personal names within the Ebla archives. This discovery, occurring significantly earlier in the historical chronicles than conventionally anticipated, challenges prevailing theories regarding the chronological dispersion of Indo-European languages. Now, Proto-Indo-European or indeed Proto-Indo-Anatolian, as we might dub it, didn't emerge in isolation. It must have evolved from an even earlier proto-language. And intriguingly, some scholars speculate that this predecessor could be Proto-Indo-Uralic. That is, a proto-language linking the Indo-European languages and the Uralic language family. Let me know in the comments whether you'd like a video on Proto-Uralic and what your favourite Uralic language is. And if you're wondering, my personal favourite Uralic branch is this one. Since 1989, Frederick Courtland has periodically published work concerning Indo-Uralic. Here I can recommend a text from 2010. And in 2019, researcher Pero published an interesting analysis demonstrating the similarities between Tocharian and Uralic interrogatives. 
This analysis can be found as part of a wider collection of texts concerning Indo-Uralic and Indo-European found in this book. At present, in the estimation of many, the linkage between the Uralic and Indo-European languages via a shared proto-language is deemed insufficiently supported by evidence. However, with each passing year, the corpus of evidence seems to grow, suggesting a potential for further exploration of their linguistic connections. Now, whilst the exact relationship between the Anatolian branch and Proto-Indo-European might be up for debate, the existence of the Anatolian branch is undeniable. But what actually makes up this branch? Well, take a look at the following table that I've prepared using data from pages 63 to 65 by Clawcourst in the following book. Now I've made two key changes to this table and to the data that was presented in the chapter by Clawcourst. That is, I've added information about Kalashma, this new Anatolian Indo-European language that has been discovered in the archives of Hattusha. And I've included what I've termed Ebla Anatolian. Ebla Anatolian is acknowledged by Clawcourst in his chapter but he doesn't cover it explicitly, citing a lack of research on the matter. Now, basically, Ebla Anatolian is a collection of 20 names found in the Ebla archives in Syria a few centuries before our earliest attestation of an Anatolian language. Now, these names are just mentioned in the archives, but linguists have noticed that the names have rather suspicious Anatolian forms. Some researchers therefore speculate that these names could actually be the earliest attested form of an Anatolian language. Now, before the discovery of these potential Anatolian names in the Ebla archives, the crown of the earliest attested Anatolian language, and therefore actually the earliest attested Indo-European language, went to Kanashite Hittite which was a dialect of Hittite written in the Old Assyrian script, Old Assyrian cuneiform. The corpus is rather small and it dates from the 20th to the 18th centuries BCE. Now, in this table here, I've presented all of the Anatolian languages in chronological order, 13 of them in total. We have the information concerning the region where the language is said to be from, the time period it's attested, the size of the corpus, and the script that is used. Now, when you see Greek here, please bear in mind that it means an alphabet derived from or closely related to that of Greek, although the exact relationship is usually unclear. So yeah, we have Ebla Anatolian, then we have the Kanashite Hittite, then we come into the first of the, of the major players, the Hittite language. Now, I would recommend if anybody's interested in learning Hittite or hieroglyphic Luvian to pick up the following two books. I've mentioned this book many times on the channel, The Elements of Hittite by Theo van den Hout. And in terms of hieroglyphic Luvian, by Anik Payne, hieroglyphic Luvian, an introduction with original texts, the third revised edition. Both of these books are extremely useful and extremely accessible for anybody who's looking to begin their journey into the Anatolian languages. Now, outside of Hittite and Hieroglyphic Luvian, two key important Anatolian languages, in my opinion, are Palaic from northwest central Anatolia. Despite its relatively small corpus, it does show several interesting features that aren't actually present in Luvian. And the Luvian branch, as we'll see in a few moments, is quite a substantial branch of the Anatolian language family. So Palaic is an interesting contrast to that. And for reasons similar to that of Palaic, I also think that Lydian is quite an important Anatolian variant in terms of understanding 
the Anatolian language family as a whole, particularly because a lot of its vocabulary is very difficult to compare to other lexical terms from other Anatolian languages. We also have Kalashma here, which is our new Anatolian language, as we've spoken about before, dated from the mid 13th century BCE. So far, it's attested only in one tablet, but as I understand it in Boyaz Kale, where the tablet was uncovered, uh, they're literally at the beginning of the excavation process, and we're hopeful that we might be able to find some other tablets containing Kalashma language. And as I understand it, the tablet that they found is considered to be one of a pair. So fingers crossed we find the second one. We have the Carian Anatolian language attested in some 200 inscriptions, mainly personal names, graffiti and coin legends. We also have Lycian, which is quite a useful Anatolian variant because we have a rather deep understanding of it due to some bilingual texts. All in all, we have 170 plus inscriptions of Lycian. Now, I'd like to draw everybody's attention to Pisidian, the final Anatolian language in the table, because it's only actually attested in personal names, so similar to that of the Anatolian from the Ebla archives. It's the latest attested Anatolian language from the 1st to 2nd centuries CE. It uses a Greek variant. Its placement on the Anatolian tree is difficult to find with any degree of accuracy. But wait, because there's more. In addition to these 13 languages we've just looked at, there are a few speculative branches. Usually these languages are said to have been spoken in the historical record and are presumed to be Anatolian, but other than that, we have little to no information about them. There are, however, two curious exceptions. In his 1999 book, Lude i Jenziki Starożytne Anatoli, Maciej Popko mentions that Pamphylian Greek displays influence from one or more Anatolian languages, possibly Lycian or Pisidian, but equally could be an as yet unknown variety of Anatolian. Further to this, several authors, including Jolt Simon, recently in 2023, and Kalander, way back in 1927, have noticed inscriptions in a language which is clearly Anatolian, probably Luvian, but which may possibly be a separate Anatolian language, conventionally named Isaurian. There is some evidence that this language was spoken up until the 5th century AD. Now, in his work, Klaukost also presents us with a tree model of the Anatolian languages. And again, obviously due to the debatable and meagre evidence concerning the Anatolian from Ebla, we can't place this potential variety of Anatolian on the tree. But let's take a look. So we can see that we have Proto-Anatolian that breaks off into two branches, one branch containing the varieties of Hittite and the second branch containing everything else. This second node is termed proto luvo lydian Subsequently, this branch breaks off into two more branches, Lydian, proto luvo palaic Then we have Palaic and the rest of the Luvian languages proper. And as we can see down here in the bottom right, we have proto lyco carian And here we have the Pisidian language which, as we spoke about before, is difficult to place. We could place it at the end of the branch with Sidetic. We could place it at one node higher or even another node higher. It's very difficult to attribute the exact branch for this language. And actually, as we can see, the Anatolian language family is quite bulky. There's a number of languages there attested over a wide time period. But what about Kalashma language? Well, as of early February 2024, the tablet containing the Kalashma text has been published and we are expecting an analysis of the text to be published by Elizabeth Reken later this year. Now, Reken has said in a media interview that she believes the text to be closer to Luvian than the other Anatolian branches. Of course, we're all eager to read the results of her and Ilya Yakubovich's analysis of the text and they may be able to demonstrate this relationship conclusively. 
However, we do know that the land of Kalashma is supposed to be close to the area where Palaic was spoken. Palaic shares some of the innovations that Luvian does and Kalashma seems to have similarities with both. For example, Kalashma, Luvian and Palaic seem to share the verbal ending nta. For this, you can see the second line of the reverse of the Kalashma tablet, whereas in Hittite, this ending would be. In the Kalashma tablet, we also have what appears to be the verb form mush. And it seems to be shared by all three, Kalashma, Luvian and Palaic, although its presence in Luvian is actually questioned slightly meaning potentially it's only found in Kalashma and Palaic. The verb, according to Melchert, in Notes on Palaic, 1984, means to satiate or enjoy oneself. On the other hand, in the lexicon of Kalashma, we can find similarities not shared with Palaic. Take, for example, Tawinzi, plural for I, it's the same in both Kalashma and Luvian. But according to Karuba, in an overview of Palaic published in 1970, accusative plural endings have the ending ans, za, in Palaic. As linguists begin to publish translations and analyses of the Kalashma text, and we therefore get a better understanding of its underlying nature, we may be able to position it more accurately on the Anatolian tree. It even might lead to a rearrangement of the branches. However, for the time being, using the tree model produced by Klorkost, I think it's safe to say that Kalashma is positioned somewhere under the Proto-Luvian Palaic node. But where exactly is difficult to say. And so what we have on the screen here would be our best understanding of the Anatolian language tree as of early 2024. Now I've mentioned two books that are useful for people who are interested in getting into Anatolian studies and here on screen now I'm going to present some of the key works connected to some of the other branches. Well, that's all from me for today, I'm afraid. As always, you've been truly fantastic. I do hope you found something informative and interesting in this video about the Anatolian language family. I'll be back very soon with another one. This is Learn Hittite. Drop me a like and a subscribe if you like this sort of content. Goodbye for now.